Hello and welcome to What Happened, the show that was designed to talk about things like this, or that, or sometimes even these. On today's episode, I'll be taking on one of the more popular requests brought up in my comments section over the last, oh, forever. This episode was also directly requested by Officer Mio down on my Patreon, who is incredibly patient as I went through my big horror kick during all of October. <laughs> as you probably all have surmised, the topic, of course, is The Quiet Man, which was a romantic comedy that was released in 1958. It starred John Wayne, Maureen O'Hara, and the boisterous Barry Fitzgerald. The screenplay was written by Frank S. Nugent and has we all know was based on a famous 1933 okay, okay that's as far as i'm willing to push that gag seriously though you'd be shocked at how many more results and articles there are about this farty old film than the 2018 video game collaboration between square enix and human head studios just as quickly as it was announced, The Quiet Man came and went with some truly damning reviews along the way, where it now remains as one of Square Enix's most forgotten and critically maligned projects of the modern era, which is something I would be saying to you if they hadn't just announced some new form of non-fungible garbage. Anyway, while the inside story of this ambitious melding of 3D gameplay and live action drama is still pretty mysterious, I hope to at least shine a bit more light into its many shadowy crevices. So grab your leatheriest jacket and plague doctor mask thing as we attempt to answer the question, what happened to the quiet man? It all starts with Kensei Fujinaga, whose past works include producing games with Hero in the title, which include the Half Minute and No More varieties, as well as producing the localizations of some good old Rune Factory and Ark Rise Fantasia, if you remember that one. Huh? This little brat is a veteran warrior? He then landed at Square Enix, and it's there where he had an idea that resonated strongly within him. When I was 15, I believe I got sick. What I got was a PlayStation there. That was like another world I can be in and actually save my life. I was in a room with five other kids there. Actually, one of them couldn't speak, but we didn't need any words. We played together and got excited. Sometimes you don't need words to communicate to be friends. The Quiet Man is communication beyond words, and I knew it from a long time ago. The basic idea would be to produce a title that's heavy on narrative, but revolves around the main character, Dane, who cannot hear and speaks very, very little. The story would play out with muffled audio and no meaningful dialogue, so the tale would be fully up to the player to interpret, which was a big ask in an industry that's obsessed with tutorials and handholding. Shut your mouth! I don't need you! A crucial element of this storytelling was the idea that Dane also naturally understood things about the world that the player wasn't in on, so there was also an intentional knowledge gap between you and him to further enhance the air of mystery. This experimental idea of taking out sound was undeniably a risky one, and it seems that while Square Enix were willing to give it the green light, they didn't or couldn't provide Fujinaga with a dedicated internal team under the publisher's umbrella to bring it to life. Fujinaga then turned to the West, and specifically Human Head Studios, who, after the cancellation of Prey 2 in 2011, had been mostly a support studio on big titles including Bioshock Infinite and Batman Arkham Origins, while their internal titles were relegated to smaller scale stuff, like Minimum and their mobile horror game Lost Within, which was actually kind of neat. Human Head was responsible for the gameplay portion of The Quiet Man, and if you ask me, was given by far the shortest end of the stick for two distinct reasons. Firstly, they would need to make the gameplay portions that would accompany what was essentially a live action short film, a high graphical bar to clear despite obviously lacking a full AAA budget, and secondly, 
adhering to Fujinaga's gameplay vision which was to have minimal, i.e. non-existent, heads-up display. No health bars, timer, combo counter, nothing. What's more, the combat system also needed to be kept intentionally simple as well, to make sure the focus was to remain on the story and not like table hopping or witch time. Fujinaga himself talked about how he saw this game as something people should play through in a single sitting, like a movie, so this does make sense even if in practice the combat ended up a bit uninteresting. I believe these two factors probably made up the bulk of what Human Head had to grapple with, but unfortunately I couldn't make contact with anyone from the studio who worked there at that time, and I really, really tried. That said, I did speak to someone who, while not on the gameplay side of The Quiet Man, was nevertheless integral to its development. Joe Kelly, a longtime comic book writer and one of the founders of Man of Action Entertainment, took the time to answer a few of my questions, starting with how he got involved with the project. The creator of the project, Kensei Fujinaga, reached out to me about writing for him as he was a fan of my comics work. As was often the case at the time, any work for hire gig like that was offered up to the guys in my company, Man of Action. We took on the job as a writing team. Officially, we wrote the story and the script, but to be honest, I have no clue what our final credit was on the game. We thought that the dual narrative concept was really interesting, and we loved the idea of working on a dramatic mystery action piece. Right, the uh, dual narrative, that's something we'll get to a little bit later. While multiple companies collaborating to make a massive singular game is nothing new, it wasn't typical for a smaller release to be done in the same way. To lay it all out, The Quiet Man was produced and overseen by Square Enix, with the game portion being handled by Human Head, the story written by Man of Action Entertainment, and a fully staffed film crew in Bulgaria shooting all the live action segments. That's a lot of coordination for what amounted to a brief feature film length game, so despite the scaled back scope, this absolutely must have been quite a complex production to manage. Joe Kelly also let me in on the dynamic between the main creative entities behind the game and how the script and story needed to be changed in accordance with their tight deadline and even tighter budget. Kensei worked at Square, so since it was his baby, he was the lead on development as far as I know. That said, when partners like Human Head are involved early on, they tend to have a say in development because they are flagging in advance what they can and can't execute based on budget, bandwidth, expertise, etc. So on the story side, we'd get notes throughout about assets we need to scale back slash change, etc. based on the evolving production. Some of that evolution resulted in the original script for The Quiet Man having several levels and locations drop completely, along with additional subplots and set pieces which Joe stated originally made for a grander, more dense mystery. The language barrier between Man of Action and Square Enix also proved to be a bit of an issue as it usually tends to be on projects being made with oceans in between them. Even though we had excellent translation, nuance and story points can get lost or misunderstood. Cultural perspectives are in play as well. What feels right in one storytelling tradition may fall flat in another. And of course, the late night phone calls were always fun. We were also not involved past a certain point, which is unfortunate as so much of the project was filmed. In live action, having writers there to massage dialogue and help produce the work is critical. We tried to make that happen, but unfortunately it was not possible. As far as game development goes, that's fairly common. Writing teams invariably finish their work far before the rest of the team and usually move on to other projects before anyone else. It does make you wonder though how some of the more awkward moments could have been smoothed out had Joe and co been on set during the filming. But of course, making a mixed media action slash movie game with such an ambitious audio style and communicating its appeal to fans and the press was always going to be an uphill battle. But when The Quiet Man was announced at Square Enix's E3 2018 presentation, many journalists and fans were left scratching their heads. 
Game Informer's preview article said it all in the title. I talked to the Quiet Man developers, and I'm still confused. The only other element to the game's marketing campaign was a surprisingly well-produced making of video, and really, that was it. The game was announced in June and was due to punch its way into stores that very November. While tight announcement to release Windows are generally quite well regarded in the gaming space these days, it does make you curious what Square's expectations were for The Quiet Man's performance for them to spend so little on the ad campaign in the first place. Now, while some people were intrigued by its unique premise, and perhaps the thrifty $15 price tag, a lot hangs on the execution of ambitious ideas to really catch on, but unfortunately, critics instead sounded off with their grievances over these ideas. Not gonna sugarcoat it, but the critical reception to The Quiet Man can charitably be described as pretty savage, with various publications dunking on it with headlines like Game Informer's The Sound of Failure, Eurogamer's A Juvenile Incompetent Embarrassment, and Digital Trends You're Better Off Setting 15 Bucks Ablaze Than Playing The Quiet Man. Oof. Clearly, the adventures of Dane McLeatherjacket simply weren't gelling with people. While the game clocked in at around three hours long, it still felt needlessly padded out, with extended sections featuring wave after wave of identical enemies with extremely little gameplay variation in between. You didn't get any new moves, weapons, items, or solve any puzzles, it, it just wasn't meant to be that type of game. You watched a cutscene, punched some guys, and that's really it. The moment-to-moment -moment combat was therefore heavily criticized, with many feeling it was just slow, clunky, and unrewarding. In cases like this, you'd then hope that the plot would be the saving grace, but quite frankly, it just wasn't. It's hard enough to deliver a well-told story with characters who can speak to one another on the best of days, but dropping the sound and dialogue on top of that was a real death blow. There are plenty of examples of video games presenting stories without these things by leveraging concepts like environmental storytelling, but unfortunately, that just wasn't what Fujinaga was going for. With The Quiet Man's PS4 Metacritic score in the 20s, there really wasn't a way to sweep all this negative criticism under the rug, so in what I think was a pretty unique move, Square Enix marketing leaned into it. A trailer running down the game's accolades actually started out like this. Which really takes some balls to do. Yeah, the back half of the advert puts forward some choice quotes from some of the more positive reviews, but it's a pretty earnest way to tackle the game's uh, more than divisive reception. The Answered DLC update launched shortly after and did exactly what was advertised by restoring the sound and dialogue and thus the truth of the story as it was written. Unfortunately, this didn't appear to move the needle much in the quiet man's favor. In fact, it actually kind of had the opposite effect in terms of the larger conversation surrounding the game. It's here where we can loop back around to that dual narrative Joe Kelly mentioned because while some critics and fans theorize that the answer DLC was a reactionary move on Square's part to somehow salvage the game's poor reputation, which was a little silly given that the update launched literally one week later than the game, Joe confirmed to me that was, of course, 100% untrue. Providing context to the game's plot in the form of a DLC update was always in the plan from day one, with the intent being to let players interpret what they thought the story was about, and then reveal the answers to see if they match with the player's perceptions of the events, or challenge any incorrect ideas they had developed during their first playthrough. Some people lamented the fact that you needed to beat the game once in the soundless mode in order to just unlock the answered content, which was less than ideal, considering so many disliked the gameplay portions to begin with. 
Not to mention, there were also people criticizing the non-committal nature of the DLC, when it seemed like the game was meant to empathize with the hard of hearing community in the first place. So yeah, the DLC really didn't help, and after that, Square Enix just stopped talking about The Quiet Man altogether. But when you step back and look at everything as a whole, this is absolutely one of those rare cases where everyone was just trying to make something special and unique, but it simply didn't come together in the end. While the industry has experimented with a myriad of novel storytelling techniques over the decades, from games with only text to games with minimal visuals like The Perception, The Quiet Man proved to be just too complicated and nuanced of an idea to feasibly do with limited resources, scope, and time, and this is something Joe Kelly regrets, as the idea had really intrigued him. While flawed in many ways, The Quiet Man was at least an attempt to try something new, mature, and different. So many developers and publishers take the safe route, so we get clones and sequels ad nauseum. While those games may be technically perfect and provide a predictable experience, they are ultimately forgettable and will be replaced by the next iteration. You don't get home runs without taking chances. I know that The Quiet Man was a big miss for Square and for Kensei personally, but I hope that he continues to find opportunities to experiment and to try new types of games. Nothing would be sadder to me to think that a commercial failure clipped the wings of a budding creative in any field. Now, Kensei still seems to be working at Square Enix according to his Twitter account, but as far as I can tell, he hasn't yet been credited for a project since The Quiet Man, outside of a thank you on Babylon's Fall at the time of this writing, so at least that's something. And as Joe said, while the game really was a miss, as it also amassed a number of worst Game of the Year awards, it would indeed be a shame if risky and creative voices like Fujinaga were forever forced to be quiet. Man. Oh, I get it. Thanks again to Joe Kelly for answering all my questions. And if you know of any other troubled developments in the video game or movie industries, do drop me a line in the comments below or hit me up over on my Twitter. You know, before Twitter explodes. See you next time and thanks for watching.